Uh, yeah, they're so intrinsically Dark Angel, aren't they? Listen up, Umi. This is a podcast with the most darker. This is Forge the Narrative. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the vacation tapes of FTN. Can you believe it? My name is Paul Murphy, your host. We are the Bell All Souls podcast. I'm joined by Tanya Gates. Hey, everybody. And Adam Camilleri. Hey, they brought me back. They dusted me off, off the shelf where I've been sitting lowly and forlorn. And I'm back. Hi. Red is on assignment. We wish he was here with us. His vacation is, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> out of internet connection. Ours still has an internet connection. I was really excited when he messaged the group chat to basically show us that he was still alive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Me too. Oh, <laughs> uh, but you couldn't keep us away. There's a, like, we've had drips and drabs of, like, a new edition stuff coming out. Uh, there's a Dante model that you can give a pre order by the time you're hearing this. Yeah, yeah, Man. yeah. But you know what? There's the lion. <laughs> oh, do, do. oh, that guy. <laughs> we picked a. The time to take a break. Uh, it is it has been thick and fast and heavy and crazy and amazing out here. <laughs> I know what a time. So with all the stuff coming out uh, with the new edition, of course the the current stuff. Okay, it's been a couple of weeks, and I know we've been we've been out of it for a couple of weeks. Thank you everybody for being patient with us. We definitely have very much still in the hobby. I don't know if you caught all the stuff that's happened, the big preview that happened at Adepticon. New Terminators. I mean, okay, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I don't play Space Marines, okay? <laughs> oh, man, I oh man! If only I didn't play like if only I didn't have nearly two thousand, three thousand points of Deathwing. Uh, I'm still very excited, and I'll be getting these models. But man, like I, I painted like forty Terminators straight. So looking at them, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna have to paint like at least twenty more. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, yeah, you know, it's like the the hungover being offered a drink, and I'm like, oh, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> here we go again not unhappy though i think they look awesome and i gotta i gotta give g-dub props they that they were perfect they just needed to be scaled up no need to reinvent the wheel on the terminators they are eternal perpetually awesome sculpts well done for sticking with uh, the og designs the indominus army armor um funnily enough very like uh well named in hindsight with the way the indominus crusade and all that stuff has, has come about do you uh, think you oh, all went to plan? 100%. No, no, they just have a big wall of I words, and they just came full circle back to it in time for the relaunch of the, the Terminators. It was just a <laughs> pure coincidence. <laughs> I wonder if there's a certain vocabulary of space brains that just occasionally wheel them out. Like someone a long time yeah. ago just decided this is the 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 20 I words that yes <laughs> yes that we have to use over the course of X amount of years or whatever they finally get to wield this one out well it all it all happened many years ago when as a member of the design team watched a very pivotal episode of Sesame Street it just so <laughs> happened to be the the letter I was the 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 um the letter of the episode and they were just like man that is a great letter the let's just this this is it no no pure letter is there in the the lexicon of humans uh and so they just like <laughs> i is where we're at i is what we're about let's roll so as we mentioned this is the vacation blog so this is not the start of season two just yet was, uh, was, 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 back on that tangent though because i will not be derailed I've, oh. I've, I've, I've been stewing <laughs> you gotta get it out stew for too long um <laughs> Was anyone else disappointed when the the, was it the Desolation Desolator Marines came out and they weren't named an I word? I was like, missed opportunity, guys. What what would you okay? What what I word would you have named them? Do we have Instigator Marines yet? No, that was that was the first choice. So are the the Incontinence Marines. Yes, yeah, that that's it. <laughs> Why are they painted brown? <laughs> It's, don't it's go, don't new, go that far. <laughs> no, it's it's the new it's the new um uh, uh, successes to the space wolves that we've never heard about. <laughs> the, well, what would be the? It's not the Cleveland Browns. It's, it's got to be like a space word for Cleveland, um, <laughs> Clevelandian <laughs> Browns. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I'm taking us on a dark path and I apologize uh, instead in advance. Of, instead of Fenrisian wolves, they have mules. 
they ride mules into battle. Oh dear. <laughs> this is what we can get away with playing in the gap in between actual episodes. This is a bonus episode and oh, the, what everyone that has reached out in between when we took a break and now thank you very much. It absolutely is the people we've encountered at, at live events, the people that have said stuff on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. Thank you so much. We're going to be back. This is one of those things, just kind of refocusing everything. It's absolutely amazing. I can't wait to get back and going with regular content. But there's been so much stuff coming out. And I said we do, we talk about some vacation stuff. And this is it. Well, I'm recording from a very auspicious place. I'm uh, so I'm I'm on my travels. I'm I'm traveling around the United States at the moment. The last little leg of my three month jaunt. You know, been to LVO, been to Cherokee, been to uh, wonderful Adepticon where I had a phenomenal time. And now I find myself in one of the most famous basements in the land, <laughs> a, a venerable treasure trove of uh, 40K and, and uh, Warhammer memorabilia. Um, I, I don't know. Where could I possibly be in the world? Where do you guys think? Give us a pun. <laughs> We'll we'll try to leave. I'll try to talk so the silence doesn't get edited out during this period of time. But if I were to to like look around this pillar, I would actually see you over there. <laughs> so. I'm sitting at Paul Murphy's gaming table right now. Uh, yeah, we had a had a lovely dinner with his family. It was my very great honor to be hanging out with the great man in his in his dwelling. Uh, yep, we're here. It, it, yeah, Adam is here just outside of Atlanta. Uh, pleasure to have you here with us, uh, Tanya. Have to make it down here eventually as well oh i would love to i would love to anytime that i see pictures of georgia i'm like it looks really nice there it's pretty nice legitimately mm-hmm. it's, it's quite nice i spent a couple of days in savannah before i came here what a cool town but i'm glad you brought up adepticon because that was where some of this information hit where we did a lot of live streaming on the games workshop side so if you haven't checked that out check out some sigmar some kill team coverage some uh, adepticon team tournament coverage and then the preview of everything that actually got launched uh, that we're talking about this this big edition change coming up. Nobody knows exactly what to expect just yet, but we've got a lot of interesting little things. Characters joining units. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> we have a throwback. Uh, jump full circle. Jump full circle. <laughs> you, you, Universal Special Rules are back, baby. Yeah. Addition, yeah, in addition, we're all rejoining our units as, as we were. Uh, with some more terms and conditions, uh, as stated by G-Dub, you know, no longer able to have innumerable characters join different units. It's very closely curtailed and curated what can and can't uh, can and can't join a unit so no more you know clown carring seven or eight characters onto a <laughs> unit of fenris in wolves uh, uh, paul stop it <laughs> <laughs> super friends very near and dear to my heart you know whatever so well, but... it, it really feels like g-dub has looked to the past and seen what worked you know, in editions gone by and then are trying to use what they've learned from the last two as well. So this could be an amalgam of some of the best bits of like the last every edition. And I'm really excited to see where it goes. Uh, let's talk about Dante if we can though. Uh, so Dante Tipping. is up for pre-order by the yes. time you're hearing this, this episode, uh, I believe. And uh, cross the Rubicon as they say, and become Primaris. Uh, I mean, it's bound to happen eventually. I wonder how his old bones took it. I hope there's some. I hope there's some fluff, and he, he, he like, <laughs> yeah. He, he, someone tries to offer him it while he's back his walking stick, and he throws it away, breaks it over his knee in defiance <laughs> to the the whims of time. Uh, <laughs> well, what I love about the model, and it's it's it's, a, it's an amazing model. So Games Workshop did send a model for us to take a look at, and you know, I got to paint, got to build it, and everything. And you you couldn't tell he doesn't look a day over nine hundred and seventy five. <laughs> Is that is that the 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 the, the glorious twenty seven years old twenty eight years old for a, a space marine? <laughs> well, he is. Oh, he's the oldest living space marine. Uh, I believe Dante is is still in the in the canon as being the oldest living space marine. That obviously isn't in a isn't in, in a, a psycho- in a dreadnought. Yeah, because Bjorn would be would would, uh, would Bjorn be ish. Like, you can't say living ish. Yeah, exactly right. He's, he's living adjacent. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but the model looks yeah. amazing. Uh, painted up well, goes together pretty easy. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, retro reader armor goes a long way with this model. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, yep. did you paint it all non-metallic metal? <laughs> I did not. <laughs> so, oh, okay. <laughs> I just uh, thought that would be like the centerpiece that you might try mm-hmm. it on. You know, Insert, uh, ain't got time for that meme. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't have time for that either. I so. have painted <laughs> gold with just washes in the past before, though. Mm. Oh. Uh, you can you can paint uh, 
gold with washes. And I will say, I don't know if y'all remember a long time ago that I painted a, um, uh, a Custodes with just contrast yellow over silver. Mm. Like you can do that. Like different nice. ways. There's a ton of different ways to paint gold. But when, as someone who may or may not own, I don't know, 50 or 60 sanguinary guard, they all done retributor armor. <laughs> Dante's going to get the coverage, it. the coverage of retributor armor. That is an amazing paint. No, it's yeah, a miracle. The, as far as like blocking, blocking in metallics, I think is one of the biggest chores to me. Mm. You, I don't feel that way when I'm using retributor armor. Yeah. It really doesn't feel like it. It acts like a metallic paint, like many others, but I, oh, man, I remember the days was the Ironbreaker back, back in the old pots, the really old pots. Um, the ones, you know, with the, the black screw on screw lids. tops. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I just remember trying to get coverage over black, and it always just came out spotty and with lines and streaks in it, and you could see where the brush strokes were. It wasn't a great time. We have come a long way. Uh, in this episode, I may, when we take a break here in a minute, I may inject an interview if I can make it work. I recorded the interview over video. I'm going to try to reduce it to, to audio. There may be a cool interview after the break. Just saying. So hang out uh, for the whole episode. It's going to be a cool episode. Uh, and I know I talked a lot about Dante, but I think we do need to give the lion his due. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> right after this break. <laughs> Damn. So we're going to take a break. In the words of the glorious red pal, dang. Dang. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take a quick break. Then we're going to come back. It may be uh, if I if I can't figure it out. <laughs> It's just going to be us after the break. If I do figure it out, you're going to have a cool treat. Uh, it's going to be slightly on Warhammer related, Warhammer adjacent. Uh, and then when we come back, it'll be us again. Hold on for a minute. FTN is brought to you by Discount Games Inc. Please visit them at www.discountgamesinc.com. And don't forget to ask Jay about ways to save even more on your hobby projects. Hey everybody, I'm joined by Dan Abnett. I can't even believe I get to say it. Mr. Dan Abnett, welcome to the show. Thank you very much indeed. I know we've talked in the past, we've run over some things, but I want to kind of, if we can go back to some ground we talked about, you know, things like the Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh. You know, like, we are, you're responsible, if, if people are, are aware, for the collection of characters that are like the cinematic universe of Guardians of the Galaxy. Yes, that is my fault. Yes, that, <laughs> I did that. Uh, yeah, the, the Guardians of the Galaxy as a concept, I suppose, existed in uh, 1969, different group of characters. Uh, completely different. Like, completely I know it's one of those. And, and I'm very fond of those. And indeed, I've written those as well. But, you know, that, that, they were the ones that I, as a kid, grew up reading uh, whenever there was a cosmic story in the Marvel Universe. Uh, they are the cosmic heroes, loved them. Um, and, yeah, in the, in the, what was it, about 2007, 2008, worked on the sort of cosmic events like Annihilation and Annihilation Conquest at Marvel, which was sort of an attempt really to 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 re, uh, rejuvenate the cosmic side of things and ended up being asked to do a team book. I was writing Nova as a solo book and I would write a team book that, um, that, that was a, a cosmic team. And I cherry picked the characters who made that team up from ones that were available, some that have just been, you know, redeveloped at the time, some that have been long forgotten. And just as a present of, of I don't know what, decided to call them the Guardians of the Galaxy, even though they were nothing to do with the original team. They were such a renegade team, it was like, let's steal the name. Um, which, it almost seemed like it was the the, yeah. the ego of the character, you know, well, Star Lord, I guess, you know. The, yeah, like, yeah. Well, and Rocket, I think, just yeah. going, yeah, we'll have that name. No one's using it. Well, somebody was, and that, and again, that led to stories as well. Um, you know, sort of, you know, which is the guy's thing. But yes, that was that, and it was a it was a pretty successful book. People really enjoyed it. Got some critical acclaim. I loved writing it. Never in a million years would it occur to me that that would become a movie or indeed a little franchise within the franchise. And so I was very surprised when they said, do you know what the next film's going to be? It's going to be Guardians and it's going to be, to one of the word putting it, your Guardians, the version that you came up with, which was, uh, which is still strange all these years later. Whenever you know, Guardians Christmas special comes out on Disney and I go, really? Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> No, it, it's it's pretty impressive. Unless it, I don't know if we've talked in the past about you know, like your relationship with comics. Like, are you a fan of the of the genre? Do, do, were you uh, like what got you into into that process at all? Because I, I would have to imagine that it's a lot different than novels. It very much, and it, and 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 it takes precedent. I think really. I, uh, um, uh, yes, I am a huge fan of comics. I mean, uh, in the broadest sense. Um, 
uh, all sorts of different comics. So, so um, as a kid, I as a kid I loved drawing. I was quite artistic. My parents were artists. Uh, I loved drawing. I loved writing stories. I loved reading stories. So I read a lot. Blah 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 blah. blah. Typical. Um, uh, I I discovered Marvel comics fr- through a friend at school when I was about eight or nine years old. And he also loved drawing, but he was so inspired by Marvel comics, he used to draw his own comics. And they, they struck me as being incredibly dynamic. I'd never seen anything like it. I was aware of comics, but not, not in that kind of American superhero sense. Um, and at that point, I started doing the same thing. I realized that the two things I love writing, doing most, which is writing stories and drawing pictures, I could do at the same time if I did my own comics. So for years, my hobby was writing and drawing my own comics of all sorts. And, and my love of comics and my interest in comics, so, so both Marvel and DC, but also, you know, sort of the, you know, the traditions of British, British comics, you know, sort of the, the, the war comics like Battle and stuff like that. And also Britain's 2000 AD, Home of Joe Stredd and everything like that, super, superhero, uh, science fiction comics, all sorts of things. I just couldn't get enough of it. Um, and um, I think there came a point, I guess, where I, I realised that I was, I couldn't draw well enough or fast enough to keep up with the stories I wanted to tell. <laughs> uh, and in the meantime, I, you know, I, t- teenage years, I went to university, I did all sorts of things. I have no idea what I'm going to do with my life. Thought, you know, it was t- probably going to be more to do with writing or, or, or English or something. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I was, um, somebody suggested when I left university, they said you should get a job in comics because they knew I liked comics. So I basically ended up getting a job as a, an assistant uh, editor, trainee assistant editor at Marvel's London offices where I worked for several years and, and, and everything we worked on there was essentially the sort of junior licensed stuff. So it's things like Ghostbusters and Transformers and Thundercats and all that kind of stuff. And I loved it. It was exactly what I, you know, it, it, this, this, so I started in comics when I, as a professional, my first jobs were in comics, uh, learning it from the inside as an editor, working on all these characters, learning how to work on a license, uh, you know, understand a license and do it justice and put it into a comic, no matter what. It, and it could be the Mister Men or or, or or Care Bears or um, I don't know, Sylvanian. Well, fam- to translate it, I mean, to speak about that for a second, it's like the the stories for like Transformers is an example. You know, it's like mm-hmm. it's kind of weird that Transformers is like only a season and then the movie and then two more seasons, but yet it's hundreds of you know we we well pretty close to by that anyway but then we've got the comics that tell different stories yeah. and that's where actually a lot of like some of the meat of these characters came from oh yes yeah yeah and that's absolutely true of a lot of big franchises i mean i mean i think gi joe which is another great one i worked on the british action force version but but larry hammer's work on gi joe in america as on the comic was absolutely fundamental and ended up um, informing the biographies they put on the backs of the cards for the characters. I mean, that's how that's how fundamental really? it was. Okay. So, yeah. So, so that's what I started out doing, and I, and I, and and we. So I was an editor, working on the inside, working on on essentially kids, junior comics, nursery comics, Thomas the Tank Engine, whatever it was. It was just all comics, and um, because Marvel U- UK didn't do superhero comics like its American parent did, um, we were encouraged to. Right, editor, editors were encouraged to write stories in order to understand better how a story works. So I, that's what I did. And there came a point where I realized I liked doing that. I enjoyed being an editor, but I liked the writing of the stories more. So after several years, I ended up going freelance as a writer, working for them, working for Marvel, working for 2000 AD, which I'd grown up reading. So, uh, and, and, and shortly after that, beginning to work for Marvel US and then DC and people like that. Um, so I was a comic book writer for the first few years of my professional career as a writer. That's what I did. And uh, it was when it was really, I, I'd always wanted to write long form and prose uh, novels. Uh, when I I was hired by Games Workshop when they were setting up the Black Library as a comic book writer, as somebody who could write comic books, because somebody had seen me writing Conan, I think, for Marvel. And really? Something. Okay. Yeah. They didn't know that, I, that in a completely separate to that, I had a huge enthusiasm for role playing games because I'd grown up playing D&D and Traveller and RuneQuest and and not so much Warhammer because that had come slightly too late for me because I was in college by then but I had been an avid reader of White Dwarf in, in the early days so I knew the kind of Games Workshop house style and I love Games Workshop and it was like can you get the atmosphere of this stuff right and, and it turns out that I could because I knew what a John Blanche illustration looked like so I that's I how mean, I went for them. it's hard not to just like look at that and like that is that is, that Warhammer. is, that is yeah. it you can write that <laughs> Um, so they hired me on, I wrote comics for them, and they said, do you want to write some short stories, some short fiction? I went, sure, great. 
And then they said, do you want to write novels? Because we want to do novels too. And I said, yeah, I'd love to. Because I'd wanted to write novels. I think I'd actually at that point written one, if not two novels of my own, as it were, in my spare time to see if I could do it. That, that I'd never got published, but they were, they were kind of exercising, can, you know, can you, can you do this? Can you sustain a narrative in prose form? So I jumped at it and started writing novels for them. And, and it, it was like, well, I, now someone is paying me to write the novels rather than me writing a novel and then spending years trying to get it, trying to sell it to somebody. So at that point, my career sort of divided into two, where I was a novelist, but also a comic book writer. And a lot of people at that point might go, well, I'll stop writing the comics then because novels, I loved writing the novels. I really enjoyed it. And obviously, pretty rapidly, we discovered we had huge success in terms of what Black Library was capable of doing. Mm -hmm. That led me to write things for other, other publishers as well. Um, you know, a ridiculous number of novels, to be perfectly honest, but, you know, a huge number of stuff, that I, things I've done over the years. Um, but I love comics so much that I didn't want to stop writing them just in terms of the craft and the form of writing a comic script as opposed to writing a novel. And also the fact that with, you know, Horus Heresy and Siege of Terror notwithstanding, uh, novels, no, writing a novel is a very individual uh, experience but a comics are a team sport because you're right you're working with a uh, an artist and a inker and a letterer and an editor oh, and colorist. Right. so that's that's a great thing to be in so i just kept doing both and in fact i think i've been doing the, the two things parallel you know al almost to the point where i'd write comics in the morning and then stop and then i'd write a chapter of a novel in the afternoon and that was my daily you know so i could just keep doing both of those things and there came a point um i'd been doing that for about i think a decade when i was contacted by a games company and they said would you like to work on uh computer games and i said well first of all thank you second of all uh, I don't really know anything about it because I don't play computer games because if I did, I'd never get any work done. <laughs> and, and are you sure you've come to the right person? They said, no, because you, you're really good at story. That's what we're interested in, your ability to write story, not games. So at that point, I it di 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 divided a third time, so I became a game writer alongside a novelist <laughs> and a comic book writer, and that's been the case ever since. So I spend an awful lot of my time writing games, all sorts of different computer games, um, uh, and sometimes, but the very fact that I am, I've got that slight remove of what I'm interested in is the story is, is another thing. So, and I think people call me and I, I presume com it's, a, it's meant to be a compliment, although it's happened so much, I begin to wonder. They call me prolific. I'm referring to prolific because <laughs> I write so much. Are they uh, using that word in the right way? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They always say, oh, the prolific Dan Abner. I'm going, really? Um, but it's true. Um, and my defense is prolific. It's like, well, he writes a lot. Uh, you know, so it almost sounds like a sort of backhanded compliment. I'm thinking, well, I'm, I, get, I write a lot because people ask me to. And they wouldn't ask me to if I wasn't fairly good at it. So, OK, I'll, you know, I'll take it. Um, but I think one of the reasons that I do is because I love writing. Um, but um, if, if in the course of a week I'm spending a few hours working on a comic and then I'm, I'm writing a bit more of the novel and then I'm going over to a game and then I'm coming back to a comic, all this kind of stuff, it, uh, I never get stuck on something. So whereas somebody who was doing one thing, say they were a novelist, They'd hit a sticky patch in the novel. They get blocked slightly. They wouldn't know what to do next. And they need to take a couple of days off to go and do something else. What I do is go, right, okay, that's not moving. What's the other thing on my list? Oh, I've got to write Guardians of the Galaxy. Right, write Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh, that's fantastic. In the course of that, the, the problem that you were dealing with on the novel fixes itself somewhere in your subconscious. So you go back to it, you go, oh, yeah, oh, what was I worried about? That's, do you see what I mean? So uh, that's one of the reasons I can I, see I that. Sort of, Make, make make economic use of my time by just moving around and never staying in one place for too long and keeping everything fresh and and so on. So yes, yes, my love of comics is is huge. Huge. I, I don't know if you can reveal this or if you even remember, but were there any like maybe big name comic Marvel characters that were on the bubble or that maybe you were being encouraged to use as part of the Guardians? No, not at all. In fact, the reverse is true. I have to say because they were they were. These were characters that I had read in their in their various solo incarnations. Um, they'd all been tried out. Um, Rocket Raccoon, Rocket Raccoon, Groot, Star Lord. They'd all been characters that had sort of been tried and sort of failed back in the seventies and late sixties and stuff like that. And I'd read them in the Marvel British Marvel black and white weekly reprint of the Star Wars comic of all things. When Star Wars came out, obviously it was a thing. I, as a kid, I wanted to read the Star Wars comic. It, Marvel did, did this weekly reprint and the backup was was whatever Marvel SF stuff they could find lying around that was vaguely appropriate because it, it wasn't superheroes. So we got Rocket Raccoon. We got we got uh, we got uh, the, the original uh, Chris Claremont, John Byrne Star Lord story, which I adore. These sorts of things. Randall's backup in black and white, as cheaply as possible. 
uh, so I read all these characters and really liked them. I really loved cosmic stuff. So when I got to the point of working on Annihilation and stuff like that, they were obvious they were the big characters that were popular, like Silver Surfer and stuff like that. Oh, these are the characters we're going to use. Well, when you think of cosmic, you've got to have yeah, Silver exactly. Surfer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In the and, universe. Uh, but I was sitting there going, "What about all the other ones?" And they were, they were, they were sort of the broken toys at the bottom of the toy box uh, that nobody cared. Literally, nobody cared about. They didn't care what happened to them. Um, I, I get on very well with Joe Casada, who was in charge of, uh, of Marvel at the time, and he didn't understand. He he said repeatedly he didn't get cosmic comics. He didn't understand what the appeal was. He didn't he didn't like that mix of superheroes and 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 and, and SF. Um, so he just, he didn't get it. He didn't get what the thing was that would be, but he could see that I was somehow bringing it. So he just, he's just kind of like, get on with it. Just do it. I don't get it. Just get on with it. So I did. <laughs> and I would keep like digging around in the bottom of the Marvel toy box. And there were all these Marvel characters. You, you, you've got to respect the toys. Every single Marvel character is, is being created and has a legacy and you don't want to break the toys. But if you're working on say Spider-Man or the Hulk or Thor or Iron Man, you, you're not allowed to come even close to breaking the toys because it's a very big deal. These are, these are franchises that are playing, you know, you've got to, you've got to put them back the way you found them essentially um, in order to maintain the legacy of the Marvel universe with these characters, these cosmic characters that nobody cared about. And some, most people have forgotten about, they, they didn't have the same kind of prestige at all. So they're going, yeah, whatever you like, you can do whatever you like with those. So I think the guardians comic that I wrote had a certain degree of the unexpected about it because anything could happen and often did because I wasn't constrained as I would be by marquee characters like Spider-Man, that I had this responsibility, great power, this kind of great responsibility not to break <laughs> this character. And I was doing all this. And I think that's, that's, that's really what it was. It was, it was, it was, I mean, the only thing I was sort of encouraged to do was, was, was see what other things you can find that you can make something of that we're not using and never we're never going to use it we're never going to use it so do what you like with it so it wasn't like bring this character in definitely it was more a case of what could you play with and, and yeah. weirdly that's sort of become my in, in the comics certainly in american superhero comics has been my, become my sort of um reputation for the i'm the guy you call or well, certainly for a long time, I was the guy you called. If you've got a character that for some reason isn't as popular as it used to be or needs a damn good reboot or, or whatever. So, they, they, so the, the number of things that I've worked on over the years where I've really enjoyed it are characters that, that have been perceived to have been not functioning their best. Is there a better version of this that we can do? do there you go. Okay. Which is uh, a nice thing. It's a nice thing. As a result, I suppose, there, I've, I've missed out on the opportunities where somebody's gone, he's a good writer, let's give him a prestige character and let him just write it. So there are loads of characters I'm going, oh, I'd love to have spent more time with some of these famous characters because they are, you know, great characters. But yes, there, you can go back through my back catalogue and go, yeah, he was put on that to kind of revamp that and he was put on that to revamp that and, that, like, and, and it's it's a fun thing to do it's a fun thing to, and never more never have i revamped so successfully i suppose as i did on guardians by bringing these characters into remembering them from my childhood putting them together it was the putting them together really rather than reinventing their characters it was like now put rocket with group that's an interesting dynamic you know those sort of lump them together and then and then you get a multi-billion dollar franchise out of it and i, I just sit back and go okay something something worked there and no it's something that clicked and it's a life of its own yeah and that is absolutely of course not to in any way diminish the considerable uh, input of the actors playing those roles, the special effects team, and James Gunn for for, for, for for putting together such brilliantly entertaining movies. I'm not saying, oh yeah, it was all me and they just wrote on my coattails, but but they, they definitely came from time. talking to James about I'll it. I'll say it. He, he was <laughs> no. very, 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 very specific to me about how much he liked that, not just that choice, that combination of characters, but just the tonal thing, the sort of, the sort of slightly sort of uh, disrespectful... Um, iconoclastic feel that this wasn't this these these weren't the, the typical clean cut good guys they were they were sort of rejects and they 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 thought they were more important than they actually were all that sort of stuff i think that's really almost what the what the series of movies needed at the time that they were originally introduced and and i don't think as as just as a consumer many of us knew what to make of that you know when everything else was Iron Man, Captain America, you know, that kind of stuff, yeah. Thor. And then we get this, uh, oh, it's not misfits, but you know, it definitely, definitely yeah, has its own yeah. tone. And then, you know, and then for yeah. them to be worked way into actual the mainstay, you know. Yeah. I mean, I think there are all sorts of reasons that it was chosen. I think, I think, I think Marvel wanted to see, having had several really great successful movies out with Iron Man and things like that, and the, the Cat films, uh, I think they were going, what happens if we take, what happens if we make a movie that is not, a famous thing 
you know, will it work as well? Will, people, will enough people be interested in it if we don't choose Spider-Man or whatever? I think they also wanted to see what they could do without that science fiction. They sort of wanted to do like, let's go and do sort of Star Warsian scale stuff rather than Earth-based superheroes. So that's another thing. I think I think it was also James Gunn's desire to do something where he he uh, had a great deal more creative control that he wasn't stuck to a particular version of things which is exactly what i'd enjoyed on the comic he could see very familiar (laughs) see the elbow room there and i also think that they they weirdly at that point weren't able necessarily to draw upon the famous the very famous cosmic characters that they might have you might have expected silver surfer and stuff like that and because they were tied up with fox it's like well what else have we got do you know what i mean and, I, and that, so guardians of the galaxy by default well we've got this what can we do with that and then you and, and the answer is almost anything you want to um, you so. <laughs> now this is a, a warhammer show so i <laughs> we have to talk about warhammer a bit so the end and the death you know, I guess part one is is in folks' hands right now, mm-hmm. and I, I'm sure people are feeling certain ways. Have you <laughs> have you maybe been contacted by any enthusiastic readers out there that are you are either working their way through it or are finished it with the? Uh, I I I have uh, yes. I I I tend not to go looking for feedback or reviews. I like and I also like to get it in person. I love to get, do it at a convention and get you know rather than rather than looking. I I, I just think you can. When you're working on a on a global franchise like uh, like Warhammer, um, you can't please everybody. Let me put it that way: you cannot please everybody because everybody's got their own version of what what's the right version of this universe. In the same way, they've all got their own version of what the hobby is when they create their army. You know, the, the, no two I don't know space wolf armies are the same because everybody's brought their own. That's the, 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 you know Warhammer that's a great example. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> literally encourages you to. It, to sort of personalise what your contribution, what your part, your take on the universe is. Um, therefore, it's you can't, you're not going to be able to please, please anyone. And I knew that that um, you know, I've, I have I have been very nicely reviewed and received over the years with my books. But there's always somebody who goes, oh, I don't like that. So I, you know, because it doesn't fit with their way of looking at it, and that's absolutely fair because you can't. If I tried to write something with the attempt to please everybody, two things would happen. One is it wouldn't anyway. <laughs> because you can't <laughs> and two you'd end up with something that was bland so what i try and write is with with is um the version that i think is the most effective sort of the version that would please me that fits in with the ip do you know what i mean because i think if you've got one happy customer right, the person who's imagining it then maybe you're going to get some others that way yeah so, sure. and, I, and i think that's true of all the things i write uh, and it matters less when it's one of my own series when it's something that is core to the universe then there's an awful lot more input goes into it in terms of getting it in inverted commas, right. But even then, you know that just because of the scale of it as, an, as a thing from everybody's point of view, the scale of the reactions is going to be extreme as well. So so I thought when I don't usually go looking for reviews when it comes out, I'm not going to look for reviews because because the, you can guarantee the first one will find will be somebody going, I don't know why they let this guy do it. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's completely <laughs> wrong in every Who is this guy anyway? Who is this guy anyway? You know, I've never liked his work. He should have, you know. And I thought, I don't need I don't need that. I've spent two years doing this and I'm exhausted and I've done the best possible version I can do. If you don't like it. You don't like it. I'm not, I can't fix that now. It's you know, I Oh, it's truly it. amazing. But we you know where, and I mean that sincerely. I'm, I'm about halfway through, and I'm uh, again turning every page here, any opportunity I get. But there's these characters that we have developed a really emotional connection to the big yeah. and the small characters. And you know, yeah. I mean, I mean, let me let me clarify that the human and yeah. the the not so human characters we have developed these relationships with, and so you know, we are. We've had a lot of time to kind of develop what where where we think they're going. Mm. Yeah, I, yes, there is always that, and everybody's got their own idea about what it's going to be. And even when you're dealing with something like the um, the Siege of Terror, the Horse Heresy, because that story is already known and has been known since the late eighties, um, everybody thinks they know where it's all got to go. And certain and, and definitely bits of it have got to go to certain places. There are certain beats of the story that if I miss. I've got it wrong. Completely. We're very familiar with like the, the, the specifically yeah. the last beat or what we exactly. know to be the last beat. And currently. there are more of those big beats in the final part of the story than anywhere else in the whole thing. So it's like they were they were like slamming together like cannoning uh, pool ball. Pool, you know, it's like oh my god, I've got to do this, and then the, 
And also with a lot of them over the years, there have been contradictory versions of what that law is so that you can take any particular one of those events and go, well, there's like five or six different versions of exactly how it played out, who was present, what it was all about. So you've got to balance those things out too. So so the the just the possibility of someone coming to the book and going, oh, this isn't what I was expecting, or this isn't the version I wanted them to do, or why has he done that? You know, a huge... I have been... And I'm, do you know, I'm good with that. <laughs> I'm good with that because it's like, this is the... Like I said, this is the best version I can do. I have not gone looking for reviews to go back to what you were saying earlier. I have seen plenty of lovely ones that people have sent them to me or they've made comments. That clearly, there is a, a an enormously positive response to this, which is delightful. And some of them have, have actually picked out as the things that they really love, things that I'm hoping people would like and maybe thought they wouldn't notice. So that's also gratifying. Um, and, 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 and I think if you write a book or make a film, or whatever else it is you're doing. If you do it that is universally so beloved that there is a, you can't find a single person saying there's a thing wrong with it, then you have by default done something wrong. Because of, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not how being creative works. I, 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 just, I just think that's it. And I always thought as well, the closest I've come, weirdly, was the previous Siege of Terror book, Saturnine. I'm sure that's if a I great was, one. I'm sure I don't mind if, telling you, it's great. Well, I'm sure if I went looking, I could find some negative reviews for Saturn 9, telling me exactly how badly I'd handled Dawn and all the other characters like that. But I don't think I've ever written a book that was so universally beloved. Um, the feedback I got eventually or sent on that was huge. And I'm going, ah, oh, that's so great. When, I, when they said, and we want you to write book eight now, and I'm going, great, I get to deal with the big stuff. But also at the same time, oh, my God, performance pressure, that's going to be terrifying. Um, I thought to myself, There's, it doesn't matter how, it doesn't matter who writes the last part of The Siege of Terror. And it doesn't matter how well they write it, okay? People are going to be less prepared to like it than they were the earlier parts because every single earlier part, Saturnine's a really good example. If you read Saturnine and you loved it, but you thought, oh, he didn't mention X, Y, or Z, you go, yeah, oh, there's another book coming, though. It'll be in that. Do you know what I mean? So it postpones the ultimate feeling of whether the, the series as a whole has done justice to your expectations as a player or reader. When you get to the last book, you're reading it going, well, it's either got to be in here or they've got it wrong. Do you know what I mean? And I yeah. think you're always, so, it, and I, so I just, and that plagued me a bit when I started writing it. I was going, oh my God, I'm going to, there's something I won't have thought of. And somebody will go, you never went back and whatever. And I thought, well, I can't, I can't. I've, I've been as thorough as I possibly can be. Um, what I've got to do is enjoy writing the best version of this, what, what I've got now, and, and hope it suffices. And so the response, the, I have to say, the, res the response, which I'm sure I'm going to see more of over the coming months, is, is, has been really positive, and, and that is great. And if you don't like it, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, but, you know. <laughs> oh, no, no, no uh, caveats or hedging here, you know. I'm saying to, to, to the audience out there, to anybody who reads it and go, well, that's not what I was expecting, you know, that's not what I thought it should be, well, then then you stick to your head canon, you know, your, your version of it, because I'm sure it's great, and I'd love to read it myself. Man, but, you know, I, <laughs> I do have, like, a vision of what those final moments on the, the, in the Vengeful Spirit command room are, and I'm not going to mention it, by the way. I'm not going <laughs> to... No, no, but, but the, again, if I, I writing these books, I, I have done my due diligence to the best of my ability, so I have, I have played around where there is room to play around to make you go, oh, wow, I didn't see that coming, or oh, that's unexpected. But I've also gone to the absolute definitive sources. I have, the number of times I've read that Bill King short story account that was in, what is it, um, um, Slaves of Darkness or one yep. of the... Yeah, the, 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 the the two paragraphs that this has all been, you know, yeah, expanded yeah. from. Yeah, absolutely. Looked at that over and over again. Looked, analyzed it, going, "Oh, is there is there something? Is there something there? You know, here's the main beats. Is there, is there things there I can draw out?" Of? So the, the, there is a couple of things. And again, I can't mention them because they're spoilers. But a couple of things I've done with the book, which deliberately address the sort of uh, law conflicts between: is it did this happen or did it happen this way? And I'm going, "Do you know what? Let me show you this. There's actually there's a third way." Um, and then you go to things like the uh, the Visions of Heresy card game, the brilliant book that they produced. Yep. That, which again, as far as I'm concerned, is something of a definitive text. Is that um, is that although you know it, it's got all the basics there, and sometimes in in, in enormous detail. So you open uh, 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 that book, for instance, on that amazing double page spread of the I think it's Adrian Smith painting of of Sanguinius lying at Horace's feet, that, the Emperor yep. facing many people's one desktops. Of the, yeah, yeah one, of the, <laughs> one, of the, one of the greatest bad pictures in the history of Warhammer 
uh, illustration. And that's saying a lot because it's not John Blanche. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's like this is, this is one of those moments. I remember the first time I saw that and went, oh, my God. So for the, for, since I first saw that picture in terms of the Horus Heresy, I know that's what I've been heading to. And when I get there, whatever else those sequences are at the end of the climax, they are that. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yep. how do I put that in words and then do all the other things I wanted to do? I'm not I'm not going to go, oh, and it turns out that the interior of the Vengeful Spirit was a very, very tasteful um, um, shade of green with... Uh, it's with, actually uh, wall-to-wall like, carpet, wall-to-ceiling yeah, yeah. carpet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know, all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to deliberately steer us away from an image that is so defined what that moment is, that, that, it, that sort of that is essentially there that is essentially there hopefully when you when you get to that part you're going to go oh it i know what this looks like you know i know what this looks like it, you know and that shouldn't be a disappointment that should be like one of these touchstone moments there's when the when the the throne room and the and things like that get d- d- described in the in the siege of terror books I, I think you should flash to those your mind should flash to those definitive images of john blanche and people like that of what the throne looks like and the eternity gate and those sorts of things because because that's what we've been striving to to get the prose and the storylines and the narrative to meet that expectation of vision that was so brilliantly project, created often quite a long time ago. Uh, so there isn't a sense that they, they you know they're not meeting where they should meet, and there's no sense of I hope um, uh, that it's a letdown. We finally get there. It's like oh. I thought it could be bigger than that. You know what I mean? It's, uh... I, I do not think that's going to happen at all, especially <laughs> with how this is this is building up. But Dan, it is an amazing pleasure to speak with you. Thanks for coming and sharing your insights with us. And I mean, I know this is just something that people cannot get enough of. So hopefully we can we can come back and talk about some of the stuff in the future, especially after everyone's had time to have it have it land with them. And and this, uh, is, what I, this is what I'm thinking. I'd love to come back on and talk to you where we've got the sort of the, the freedom of being slightly less spoiler spoiler careful so we can i can actually sort of, sort of dismantle a couple of bits of the book for you and say actually do you know what the reason i did this is and you can actually see that's going to process in work so there you go i can't wait thank you for your time thanks for coming on i know everyone's gonna love it and i will definitely be back in touch as soon as possible fantastic thank you you're listening to forge the narrative We are back. I hope you enjoyed the cool thing or didn't hear the cool thing. It'll come out later. We'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying new things. And this is the in-between times. That's it. The lion. Yeah, boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Yeah, no. Look, we have Dark Angel players on the show, and we're certainly going to give them the open, for, you know, open forum here to discuss. If you are unaware, there may be one or two, possibly Dark Angel heartthrobs present right now. Uh, <laughs> but man, they uh, nailed, nailed this min, this model, this model, this miniature. I have uh, one problem with it. I okay. don't know which head looks the best. Yeah, quality that's, freaking, that's the hardest oh. thing. Right, See, I, like I, I, normally, I normally you get one of these kits with multiple heads. And you're like, oh, that's the one that speaks to me, right? But literally all of them do, and I'm looking at them like, like I don't magnetize anything, but I might because I want to paint all of these different. I know how. Versions. When could you ever be like the thing I'm going to magnetize is the head, <laughs> not the arms, not, nope. yeah, not not the yeah. backpack. But, you know, but can, like, we, can we talk about? That? I feel like it's the helmet head. Yeah. Can, can we talk about that for a second though? I mean, look, I, I'm I'm not a Dark Angel player. I mean, I've I've played Dark Angel in the past as being a filthy meta chaser every now and then. But I, I, to me, the heads speak to the different personalities of mm. the chapter slash Legion. And Agreed. depending on what version you are running, what the, the, that the codex allows or the codex as we know it, the, the, uh, the options within the, you know, what, the, how the chapter plays seem to kind of speak to the different head of the aspects of the personality. Am I, mm. am I thinking too much into that? No, I don't think you are. Like you get like the uh, the the austere regal, you know, bare head, the uh the, the Tywin Lannister head. Uh you get the beautiful, like cowled version of the same, the mysterious kind of inner circle, you know, closed walls version of uh the, the Dark Angels. You get the you get the the knightly Baroque winged helmet, which um I'm waiting to see in the flesh because on the pictures I it looks like it's too much. It looks like it's so big, like 
it's it's just got a, a please shoot me sign written on it. But uh, it's Warhammer sized, excuse I, me. <laughs> I'm, I'm he doesn't care if you shoot him. He's got the Emperor's shield, man. Come on. It's it's right, baby. Um, and then, but my favorite, and I left it for last, is the cow with the helmet. That that does everything for me. That's that is my favorite, and that's the one I'll be building. Um, but unusual for me, I still want to have the bear head because I think the bear head has so much lion in it. So much of that, like I said, austere. I am in command. Do not test me. Do, do not believe you can step to me. Kind of look to it. It's I, I didn't for- feel that until you just said it. Like the lion, true king of the jungle. Like I am mm. here and in charge and hear me roar with my own voice. Yeah, yeah. I'm here. You're screwed. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but now the, the, the helmet with the cat, with the hood is, is my favorite. That is mwah, chef's kiss. So perfectly done. He looks terrifying with that 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 is actually that's the word i was going to use terrifying that's the most terrifying Mm. if you if you encounter that aspect you have like you have to question every choice in your life that has led you to this encounter stop yeah (laughs) yeah yeah oh no oh no oh no (laughs) yeah um i am um, I'm, I'm waiting to read the fluff because I'm so keen to hear how he's working up, why he's working up, what he's doing, what his plans. I want to know everything. I want to know so much about this story. I'm so intrigued to hear everything. Um, but uh, he's he's equipped in a very unique manner. He doesn't have the lion sword. We we you know if you oh, I, yeah I, because somebody's running around playing hide and seek with it. Yeah yeah. Well, it's also it's also kind of broken. It's it's gone to the shards of Narsal level of its life. Uh-huh. But uh, it's <laughs> yeah. There's a story there too. I want to know how he got the Emperor's shield. I want to know what his sword is, how it got made, where where he got it, what it stands for. Um, I'm intrigued at every level of this model. I think they've done a phenomenal job. The po- the the pose is great. The, oh, just the the cloak is phenomenal. The backpack is really uniquely designed. It's amazing. Really, it's almost really like lovely. a jump pack. I was like, is he got? Yeah, it does. It, it looks like a jump pack. Um, I assume it's not, um, but it it does have that kind of shape to it, doesn't it? Yeah, and there is so it, you know, which it has does. me like, oh, who, who are you pretending to be right now? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do like there's some homage page to the, to the original. Uh, sorry, well, not the original, the Horus Heresy, the, the 30k one as well. Like he's got the same um, symbols on his knee pads. Well, on on the, on the knee pad that that is you know facing front is exactly the same design. If if I'll be like a newer um, mark of armor, I suppose. Uh, and, and yeah, I just think they've done. I, I couldn't have asked for more. From a pa- painter's perspective, Tank, what do you think? A, it's a beautiful model, and I. So for me, somebody who sort of like takes the time to paint the details, I am really intimidated to oh, paint to paint a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm really intimidated by the thought of painting like one of the Forge World Primarchs or even Gilliman just because there's so much going on. But I feel like the detail that they've included in the lion is like just enough to make him feel regal and, and powerful and all of those different things without it being it, it doesn't look like it would be a slog in the slightest to paint that miniature. Like it just looks like it would be an absolute joy from start to finish. Um, but that's just my take on it. I'm I'm not a big fan of a ton of trim, if you know what I mean. Uh, like all Chaos the baroqueness or whatever. Like the th- even the thousand suns are slightly intimidating to, to the effort exactly. to get on the yeah. table. The the one that intimidates me is the cloak. Um, it's got such a unique design. To oh, it's hard to say it's got a unique design. But usually you'll see a lot of flat portions of a cloak, as if they've given you ways to not screw it up when you paint it. <laughs> this one has just folds upon folds upon folds upon folds, and you know there's a lot of ways you can just not pay attention. And oh well, that's full of null now. I guess it's a. Uh, it's time to paint that again. Uh, but there is, I mean, there's kind of everything you want here. Like you said, there is the Baroque. There is a lot of trim. There is a lot of flat. There is a lot of curve. There is a lot of a lot of everything. Um, yeah, I think it's really well executed. The watchers even don't seem to like, I get, yeah. I get a little like, like, oh, I don't want, I don't want to paint models on top of models. Mm. <laughs> like when there's multiple models on a model, I'm like, eh, is that really necessary? Yeah. But I feel like the, the watchers add to it. Yeah, I agree. I think that the watchers do add quite a bit. Um, uh, they have to be there, right? They have to be there. Like they're were so, the watchers they're so a part intrinsic. of the the lore in in the heresy? Yes, absolutely. Were they were they were ever present on Caliban, and they did travel with the lion when he left. 
when, when he went when we went on crusade they, they were present there and yeah they're so intrinsically dark angel aren't they the little little ewok sorry the jawas i said ewoks uh, no, so the, the jawas. i know uh i've just lost like 20 nerd points i'll have to get them back <laughs> I did say shards. I did say shards of Narsil. No, you're so you're that, even. You're zeroed. You're evened out. Yeah, I'm. I'm back. Yeah, I'm back to to, to cost neutral. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, but no, I, I love it. I even like the base as well. Uh, I think there has been a lot of. I, I've well known on the show for my dislike of the of the tactical rock for no reason. <laughs> this one ties into the the model quite well. This one looks like it, it, it's part of the story. Yeah, it does. It does. This whole thing tells a story. And I like you, how you can kind of tell your own story with the various heads. Uh, and then, of course, I'm sure once this model gets in people's hands, they'll, you know, exercise some creativity, all that kind well, of stuff. Further to that, I adore the way the, whoever, whoever painted this, I adore them. They've they've left it enough enough black to show the heritage of the Dark Angels whilst and, and I, I am I am at times critical of the, the 40k scheme because it looks a little too new or uh, neon it looks a little too like the highlight a little too bright it looks Tron like you know a little too bright for my liking this one is understated undeniably green tinged but with that heart of of that core of of dark black that darkness that uh, the dark angels come from uh, i legitimately did not think that we were going to see a more loyalist primarchs i thought it was the like wherever 40k was going to be b- basically gilliman versus all the chaos that you would mm. ever see well i so i did kind of uh, for for a while, I have pontificated upon the fact that there's kind of two halves of the Imperium now. After the Cicatrix Maledictum happened at the end of Seventh Edition, and kind of cut things in half, and so there's kind of scope for there to be a Primarch on each side of the rift. And I think it's been alluded to in the fluff um, on the community sites that the Lion may be on the other side of uh, to Gilliman, and so there is scope for a lot of storytelling to take place before they become reunited should they become reunited hell we don't know that yet yeah they might and you're right they might not actually ever be even able to contact each other mm. yeah really it'd be <laughs> that's gonna be a i would love to be a fly on the wall like <laughs> for that for that reunion uh lion's like oh they brought you back hey not only they but how did you yeah, you mean they you're talking about like the Aldari. Mm. He mm-hmm. knows. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, Lion for sure will look around and be like, not doing a good job, mate. <laughs> Even if Gilliman <laughs> was doing a phenomenal job, he'd be like, pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't I can't wait to see how this story progresses now he's back in. Uh, and, and not only that, dude, we saw two Primarchs in six months. We had Angron as well rejoin the fold. This is really exciting times. It it really is, and, and it's hard to say, you know, with a, with an addition change, what what that's going to bring as far as like the landscape of what people are going to play. Uh, but you got to you got to think that these primarchs are going to still be just epic figures on the tabletop. Mm-hmm. What we're seeing is rules now as well, which have come with a lot of people loving and a lot of people criticizing. Uh, I, I will say I do, and, and so this is this is with zero zero knowledge, zero foresight. But it could be assumed that this is heralding more for what we can expect from something at this level in the future. Do you mean as far as like his lethality or what his impact on on any particular spot Im- on the table might be? Yeah, impact upon the game. So you look at you look at like what his level character uh, has done in ninth edition, or the characters like him that have been released in ninth edition, or the rules. Of, of similar like-minded miniatures of this around the same, you know, level Primarchs, you know, Bellacor, Greater Demons, things like that, something around the, the same points cost. And they do exponentially more buffing for your army. He is exponentially more killy. He's like on a, on a, on a par with say Angron uh, for killiness in certain, in certain realms, in certain combats and stuff, but he does far less for your army. Whereas you look at like, I mean, even Asriel who, you know, is half the po- near enough to be half the points kind of does more for your army because his data sheet was just um, updated to be primaris rather than be, being completely rewritten so i would not be surprised because what we've, what we've heard about 10th edition is that there'll be a lot less reroll auras because i think they've found out that it's just too easy to stack those or stack those and stack those and then just get to a point where the dice rarely matter like if you can see it and you've got enough buffs it just it just goes away there's also been a big reason why we've had to have so much more terrain 
terrain added to tables in this edition. I suppose you take away a lot of those a third player stacking. on the table. Exactly right. Yeah, exactly right. And which have which have had a phenomenal you know resurgence in the amount of rules and keywords we've given to terrain. But that has been necessary because there's been so many interactions where you know uh, I can see you. Well, here's here's this unit that has four auras on it, and you just you just deleted. Um, I think it's a really good choice by GW to pair that back and then attach real auras to only the most powerful, only the, the most grand voice of characters. And if this should herald, you know, what we can expect from these characters in, say, 10th edition or whatnot, um, I think it'd be a great move. Yeah, we'll see. I, I, I don't think you'd be disappointed if you're a Dark Angel player and you want to grab this model, though. I think it's a must-have. Uh, I don't know. My husband My husband wants to get this model, and he doesn't even have a Dark Angel's army. So <laughs> I think it's it's probably just a really good model just to have this in it. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. The gold... Yeah. So, you know, as, again, I talk about Retribute Armor and Dante and that kind of stuff and like how to paint gold and the various different ways you can paint gold. I, w- I will say I love the fact that the gold they've chosen how to paint on the lion is shaded with the red washes, you know, the the, the brownish red washes instead of just the browns. Yeah, I totally agree. It really jumps I do have off some, with the green. I do have some, I do have some funny people because naturally when this came out, a lot of people have memed on me and saying, finally, uh, uh, we finally another Chaos Primark has been, <laughs> been released. <laughs> I've, I've got a, I've got a, a mate who's talking about because he's always wanted to run a, an army of the fallen, and he's talking about. About playing the lion with the Baden's rules, leading leading an army of fallen, and I'm like, uh, I don't hate that idea, but how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's funny. Even in the article, <laughs> you know, when when asked about fealty, the Primarch's massive new sword, Seb explained, "We know Cipher, and there's rumors that he carries the lion sword. We like it better mm. when there's more mystery about it, and it suits the lion more that way. So we came up with a new sword to keep that intact." The mystery of what, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. what happened to it. That's, I mean, it's good times. I love the, the fact that there's, you know, we're getting this massive evolution of story, but yet still ties back to the main things that people appreciate mm-hmm. about the Legion, the faction, the, sorry, the yeah. chapter. Well, and Games Workshop should be doing this kind of more and more over the last, I guess the last year. I mean, Azrael and Dante both are just um, up, like upgraded versions of like, ancient miniatures miniatures that are 20 you know 25 uh is, is dante 30 years old is that model 30s no it couldn't be 30 years old please don't tell me so he's no old. it may um, even be more it may be more than that it's, yeah. uh, yikes but you know they paid absolute tribute to the legacy of that model and they just took the took what was awesome about it because and just brought it into the new the new sphere brought it into the modern era of the game and i think it's a great design choice by them you don't need to reinvent the wheel for some of these bespoke uh, legendary figures in the game. You just you just bring it like the, exactly the same with the Terminators. Don't no need to reinvent the wheel. These things are awesome. Just give them a new spin. You mentioned Dante. I do remember, and people have heard us talk about this on the show before. But I I painted Dante, the Avatar of Cain, and Jane Zar on the same weekend. Some of the best models I've ever painted. Like and it was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> what did like all of the different uh like streams sort of collide in one spot at your painting desk to make that like the ultimate in hobby experience for you just inspired remember like staying up the whole weekend watching i mean i could tell what i'm wa- watching but it may like wrestling you know <laughs> like on tbs <laughs> or whatever and just they would play like three or four hours at a time or whatever and just to be able to just jam some painting sessions it was amazing uh but having that all come back i used to also be a big wrestling nerd so i can't judge you well again it's it's bringing back all this this nostalgia you know and and then Mm -hmm. so i've got the nostalgia from having dante but then having this the model of the lion represent nostalgia from all the stuff that you've thought about in your own mind. And I love it that you brought up the fact of the chaos primark or whatever. We, I know, I know we've discussed this before, but anyone who's just discovering the show, we typically do a, you know, a show a couple times a month, at least we're going to keep, we're going to start that up again. This is a, if you're just discovering this right now, this is our vacation blogs, but everything that you have, have thought about the line over the course of the years, it's made its way on this model, but there's also this, there's very two, modern elements that you might not know are modernization and that's the sword and the shield like what is that opening up yeah yeah new story threads at a minimum uh yeah (laughs) so uh have you guys been paying attention to the memes like uh you know because Gilliman has the has the emperor's sword and now we've got the line with the emperor's shield maybe we'll get um 
<laughs> Jagatai will come back with the Empress Toaster. Yeah. Or his, there was an ironing his, board. His baseball cap. Um. <laughs> I mean, if anybody's going to have the Emperor's Toaster, it's going to be Belisarius Call. That's right. Uh, he he is the Emperor's version. Toaster. That's uh... <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what's happening on that that carapace he's got. That's true. You could have anything under that cow. Toast is anything delicious. Under that it's absolutely. <laughs> Bit of Vegemite, you know. But we haven't no. seen the story evolve this quickly in the whole history of Warhammer. So I actually do love that, that the fact that we have I don't I don't know how far we've advanced the story. How if you look at the whole clock, you know, of of Warhammer Mm. How, how the story has not moved this dramatically, even though it's just one or two ticks yeah. forward in forever. It's exciting. Well, um, G, G Dub built up a lot of story threads um, through, I think it was from fourth edition to seventh edition with like all, you know, the, the doomsday clock is at 1159. Um, and, you know, Necrons waking up, uh, high fleets, biggest orc wars, all these things, and now they're they're at this beautiful point where they can just decide which thread they want to pull, and uh, generate a whole edition worth of story to to back it. I mean, this one. I mean, we had we had um the Return of the Silent King for eighth edition. Now we're getting the the thread being pulled of you know the biggest high fleet the galaxy has seen thus far, as in the in the actual high fleet of Leviathan, not just the tendrils, is looming as the the big bad for this edition. And I'm I'm all aboard this train. I can't wait to see what happens in the next. Well, got to wait a couple of years, but I, I'm keen to see which threads they decide to pull in the future. Because like I said, they they set themselves up so beautifully. Um, in previous editions to capitalize in the future. Uh, and yeah, I think they're, they're going from strength to strength. Uh, that promo where they did it with the Terminator seeing the Tyranid oh. in, in its eye, oh. and the Tyranid seeing the Terminator in its eye or whatever, yeah. like this whole versus yeah. versus versus. Uh, very exciting. Absolutely. And then we saw new, so we, we know we get new um, Termagants, and then these these uh, new Lictors, not Lictors, the, the Leapers. Yeah, uh, the, what's his name? The some somebody, Von somebody. Ryan. Yeah, the, and you got to think of that's that's pretty cool. Is like, well, we don't know who that is yet. Maybe we get a story about that. But these are we're encountering the Tyranids from our point of view. So it's like us naming dinosaurs yes. and stuff. It's the, <laughs> like when we discover them, kind of thing. <laughs> I, I yeah, exactly right. Because I mean, they're called Tyranids because that's the world they ate first. Was Tyran, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, that's it's it. That's 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 all it was. Uh, so you know, Van Horse, Van whatever his name was, <laughs> Van Ryan, it's might have been Ryan. the first guy to be to be eaten by a leaf devoured. <laughs> by one of those yeah. yeah, yeah. So oh, yeah, we guess we're calling it that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what else? They previewed a new kill team box. Oh, they did. And I got to tell you, I so my husband started a Votan army, and now that I've seen the models in person, I absolutely adore them. But that one Votan with like the power knuckles, yeah, I <laughs> love that guy so much. And the like, jump pack, there's a jump pack one. Yeah, like, yeah, it's just so great. And I mean, it's in a box with Beastmen. That's pretty cool. I I mean, I haven't been around since the beginning, but I heard that they used to be playable in 40k so you could you could have beastmen in fantasy battle and then the mm -hmm. beastmen could also join into 40 you could play 40k with beastmen that's pretty cool do, do, have they told us what the name of that guy is like is he i want him to be like a pugilist <laughs> I don't know what his particular name is or like what his his uh, battlefield role is, but he is so cool. Yeah, I would love to paint that guy. No, no, I'm going to call him Biff. <laughs> <laughs> I've decided. He does kind of look like a Biff. Punchers make my cool. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness! Look, that is look, that's our show this week. Gonna like short and sweet. We're getting ready. Gonna launch eventually season two coming up soon uh a few things on the horizon um i have launched a patreon it's the first time ever there will be a patreon i'll put the link in the show notes for this uh that's one of those things in order to keep the show moving and evolving for the first time ever gonna see if anybody would like to to kick in to patreon i'm not even sure how to direct people to it because it's so <laughs> alien uh but it's gonna be there uh that is one of the things we're gonna have get editors for the show gonna hopefully keep the production value 
uh, moving and then keep on producing content when we eventually launch season two coming up pretty soon. Uh, but I hope y'all have enjoyed this. It's been great to be back and talking. I missed you guys. Missed you guys too. Uh, soon things are happening. Keep your eye on the page. Going to put this out to YouTube. Going to get out of the, to the aggregators and yeah, we'll get on more of a regular schedule coming up soon. We definitely will be producing content. Hold tight. Uh, keep the messages coming. Let us know what kind of stuff you're interested in. If you are excited for the new edition, let us know what you're excited about. If there's anything specifically that's coming out. Know that when, when it does launch, as soon as we get news and drips and, and drafts from everything, we'll be breaking down how that edition works, the new stuff coming out, and also telling you what we've been up to and just generally loving the hobby. I've missed it. I uh, truly, deeply, madly have missed my FTN hour every week. And I say hour, that's because what you guys get listen to is usually an hour. We usually, <laughs> we talk some mad gibberish <laughs> before the show usually. And I, I miss that just as much. Uh, Red will be back also. I uh, he said he's out there on assignment. We truly wish he could be here for this, but we wanted to get it out uh, just to show y'all that we, hey, yeah, we're coming back soon. Uh, Tanya and Adam, it's been amazing. Always a pleasure, mate. Oh, I always look forward to talking to you guys. We'll see y'all soon. They said, but I already subscribed. You better do it too.